has given you power. I'll say it again because I want you to think about that, but not in the ordinary church kind of way. I want you to think about what I'm saying. God has given you power where you are to handle what you're going through and to be victorious. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that. I know sometimes you don't get those results. But God has given you, given us believers, power. And I guess the question, which is the title of this message, where do you get the power from to keep going? I just said, inherent within that keep going means you're going to get some seasons in your life. Amen. Some times in your life where it doesn't look like what you're going through is matching up with what the Bible says. Have I got a witness? Have I got your attention yet? There's going to be some times in your life where it looks like you are too weak. You have no power. You're just listless and you don't know how to fight. You know, it's something we talk about spiritual warfare all the time. We talk about having enemies, which I started this uh, message with to know uh, last week that you have enemies always around you. You got the world's flesh and the devil, right? You're fighting your enemies constantly. You're fighting your mind, trying to get your mind to, you know, say and walk and be that victorious. But how come it looks like you don't have any power? How come? We're going to talk about where do you get the power from to keep going when you want to stop. And I started by letting you know, well, you know what? I need to pray. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another Bible study. Thank you for those who have joined us. Thank you for those who are listening. Let them know you directed them to this teaching so that they could not only get stronger, but so they could move on in their life. Somebody here is stuck. Somebody here does not know where to go from here. Give them some relief today through the power, the magnanimous power of your Holy Spirit. Let them tie into everything that you've left us in order for us to be victorious. Thank you right now. Give you glory and honor. Those of you who have, have joined me today, amen. Uh, sign into the chat. Let somebody know. But let's talk about an area. Get you some... Uh, you know, get your devices out, whatever you use to write. You're going to need to get some scriptures today because here is what I believe. Most believers don't have power and don't know where to get the power from to keep going in their life. And we started last week by letting you know there's no secret that we understand who Jesus is, all of us, in the name of Jesus. There's a name that's above every name. In the name of Jesus. Right now we get a, a woo Everybody gets all excited. And that's true. Because God has given him a name that's above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Okay? So we know Jesus. We just celebrated the resurrection. You know, he died on the cross in my place for my sins. Got up with all power in his hands. Gave me power. Question still remains. Where do you get the power? Where does your power come from? How do you, how do you tap in? Where do you get that power? I say we're familiar with Jesus. We're familiar with God. God. God who is our creator. God who is our father. Our father. We know them intimately. I started by talking. I was praying at a weak moment in my life. And God, and I said, God, what's going on right now? With all sermons are preached. With all the people I talk to. Why am I having this, you know, this, this listless moment going on that I can't handle a battle that I've already handled? And he said to me that I, he said, you don't know me. I said, what? God, after all these years, what do you mean? He said, you don't know me intimately enough. You know, watch this, God the Father, you know God the Son, and you talk about the Spirit as an it. But he said, the problem is, if you're going to know me intimately, then you have to know something that's a big problem in the church. We don't know the Holy Spirit. We don't know who the Holy Spirit is. We don't know the Holy Spirit intimately. Intimately, It's a something that got a hold of me. It's a it. It's a shout. It's a jump. It's a speaking in tongues. It's a running around. But it's never God. 
We're going to talk about God, the Holy Spirit, because the power, the, the power in the Trinity, we're going to talk about the Trinity, but the power in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And I want to just, you know, do away with some myths. As soon as you are a believer, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, lives in you. The Holy Spirit is a part of your life. But if you don't know how to access him because you don't reverence him or you don't honor him and you don't understand his work in the Godhead, then you're going to miss your ability to tap into the power. Yes, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God are one. That is the doctrine of the Trinity. We believe in the, Trini in the Trinitarian God. What does that mean? The Trinity means that there is unity in the Godhead and that there is personhood in the Godhead. There are, God is one God, but there are unique differences in how each part of God flows or how this one God acts through each person within God. What is that? God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, amen? And our problem is, God has chosen that the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps power in our lives and we can't live without that power. We can't maneuver without that power. We can't do anything without that power. I need you to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14. And let's take a look. That we are going through Let's see. John 14, very familiar. And in looking at John 14, we understand who Jesus is. I had this set so I could start off reading. Let's go. I gave you time find it while I found it. John 14, and let's look at verse uh, 15. Yes, follow this understanding. Verse 15 of the Gospel of John. I'm reading from a CEV translation, but that's all right. You can still follow me in your translation. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will do as I command. Then I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit who will help. And you help you and always be with you. The Spirit will show you what is true. The people of this world cannot accept the Spirit because they don't see or know Him. But you know the Spirit who is with you and will keep on living in you. Listen to that verse it says that the world, the people of the world, the B portion of chapter verse 17, the people of the world cannot accept the Spirit because they don't see or know Him. It didn't say see or know it. It said see or know Him. Go to John 16. Let's look at this phenomenon. We don't, we don't understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's the personhood of the Holy Spirit that blesses us and keeps us in God's blessing. Um, verse 8, the Spirit will come, chapter 16, and show the people of this world the truth about sin and God's justice and judgment. The Spirit will show them that they are wrong about, uh, about sin because they didn't have faith in me. They are wrong about God's justice because I'm going to the Father and won't see him again. Let me move up. I'm going to show a different verse. Yes, uh, look at verse 7. But I tell you, I'm going to do what is best for you. This is why I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going away. The Holy Spirit cannot come to help you until I leave. But after I'm gone, I will send the Spirit to you. So, we understand that the Spirit is going to reveal who God is and that the Holy Spirit is not uh, is a person and not an it. But if you don't get familiar with the Holy Spirit as you are with God, you're never going to be able to tap into your power. So go with me to Luke's God. Let's go to Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8. I'm trying to read you too much from last week. I want to pick you up right here. Acts 1 and 8. Because you're familiar with this verse. 
Come on, get your advice out. Follow me on the scriptures. But you shall receive power because my name is Jesus. You shall receive power because you know I am Jehovah. No. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world. The Holy Ghost lives in us. He is our power. He never leaves. He is God. You can call him. He understands your tears. He understands your, what you're feeling. He understands what you're going through. And right now you need to speak through to God the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can say in the name of Jesus, but don't you forget it is the Spirit of God. It is that Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that leads us and blesses us and sends us into all things. We're going to see through Scripture what the Holy Spirit does, but I need you to know one way you can tell you have power. 1 Corinthians 3.16 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Stop. First, you cannot be pushed around or defeated because you are a temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Did you know the Holy Spirit is listening, hearing, judging when the weak thoughts come? You can turn those thoughts around to God. You can listen about God and the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into a path of power and peace. I just said something. Get the word of God. Pray that word of God. Let your heart get open. And it is that spirit that dwells in you that sends that charge of energy to let you know you can handle what's going on. 2 Corinthians 6.16. What agreement? 2 Corinthians 6.16. Had the temple of God with idols, for we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said. Now make it a plainer now. You know, when I said the spirit dwells in you, he said no. Just as God said. I want you to listen to what he said. I will dwell in them. Wait a minute. God said, yes, because the Holy Spirit is God. God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God is a personal, all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, eternal person, personhood of the Trinity that wants to bless us. So how do we understand the Trinity? I'm not going to get deep. I want to give you one verse that you understand that the Trinity, although the word Trinity is not in the Bible, the doctrine of the Bible of Trinity is all over the Bible. How do I know? If you go to Matthew 28, 19, it tells us that all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, you know, teaching all people to come, observe whatever I commanded, baptizing them. How? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Wow. All three. These three are one. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're unified. They're the ones they work together to make sure we are blessed. Second, uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says that in him should dwell all the fullness, listen to the term, of the Godhead bodily. Talking about in Jesus who was in the beginning of the world, consistent before all things, but the text tells us that the Godhead should dwell in him, the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him bodily. The Bible speaks about God being a person, and it gives us several personality traits to understand that God is, God the Holy Spirit is God, he is our power source, and we need to get to know him better. Just write that somewhere. Put this in your mind. You need to get to know the Holy Spirit better. This is not some high, powerful thing for those who walk around prophesying and speaking in tongues. You can be in a small voice in your house and you can ask the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling with me. God, the Holy Spirit, thank you for blessing me. God, the Holy Spirit, show me and listen to what the Bible says, some of the things that the Holy Spirit does to show us he's a person. Are you ready? First one, it says, um, he speaks to us. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. That's powerful. Hebrews 3 and 7 
says the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Turn to it. Hebrews 3 and 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if you will hear his voice. I'm going to turn to Hebrews 3 and 7. I want you to go with me. So we can look at the context about that text that we just read. We know the Holy Spirit speaks. And I told you that's in verse 7. It tells us, but look what it says. I'm going to start reading. Um, it's talking about, in the beginning of Hebrews, who found faithful Jesus was. And then the fifth verse says, Moses was a faithful servant and told God's people, Hebrews 3 and 5, told God's people what would be said in the future. But Christ is the son in charge of God's people, and we are those people if we keep on being brave and don't lose hope. And then he talks about a rest. But look what he said. It is just as the Holy Spirit says, if you hear God's voice today, don't be stubborn. Don't rebel like those people who were tested in the desert. We focus on if you hear God's voice. But you miss the part where the Holy Spirit is human. It says, verse 7, it's just as the Holy Spirit says. Somewhere the Holy Spirit is waiting on you to calm down, sit back, and let him speak to you. He can talk to you now to get you out of your situation. If you meditate on him, if you trust him and understand he's with you, you will be blessed. And the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you through everything that you need to be guided through. But remember, it just says, as the Holy Spirit says. And if we understand that the Holy Spirit talks to us and the Holy Spirit is God, then we don't have to worry about what we're going through. What else does he do? He reasons. Um, Acts chapter 15, verse 28, says that the Holy Spirit not only speaks, he reasons. For if it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burdens than these necessary things. We do understand the context was they were talking about the Gentile believers. And, you know, some of the apostles wanted the Gentile believers to have to be circumcised. And they were going to tell the people they didn't have to be circumcised and follow the law as long as they had Jesus. But this, these are the things they needed to do. And it says the Holy Spirit is letting us know that we don't want to lay any greater burdens on you than these that are necessary. Let's look at that. So you can get the full context of Acts. Go with me to Acts 15. Come on, this is Bible study. Grab your Bible. Acts 15. And in Acts 15, it says in verse 28, I'll, I'll, I'll move up so you understand what's going on in this chapter. All right, so if we go to start at verse 22, it'll help us understand what the apostles were saying. And the apostles, the leaders, and all the church members decided to send some men to Antioch along with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Silas and Judas for Silas, who were two leaders of the Lord's followers. They wrote a letter and said, We apostles and leaders send friendly greetings to all of you Gentiles who are followers of the Lord in Antioch, Caesarea, I mean, Caesarea and Sicilia. And we have heard that some people from here have terribly upset you by what they said, but we did not send them. So we met together and decided to choose men and to send them to you along with our good friends Barnabas and Paul. These men have risked their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. We also are also sending Judas and Silas who will tell you in person the same things that we are writing. The Holy Spirit has shown us that we should not place any extra burden on you. But you should not eat anything offered to idols. You should not eat any meat that still has blood in it or any meat of any animal that has been strangled. So what they were doing is telling them, stick to the kosher laws, but the things that save you are not the things that you eat and drink and you don't have to do the rest of the laws in order to follow Jesus. So the Holy Spirit speaks, listen to him. Holy Spirit reasons, but the Holy Spirit also understands, thinks and understands. Look what it says, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. But God 
had 2 Corinthians 10, 2 and 11. But, I mean, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. But God hath revealed unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit thinks and understands. It searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit not only thinks and understands, it has a will. It wills things to happen. That's why I tell you when you pray, if you understand the Holy Spirit is a person, he lives inside you and he's with you right now, you can pray right now in whatever situation you're going through, whatever darkness, God can lift that burden. A miracle. God can send you a blessing. Because when you talk about God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, is our power source. Whatever you need power for is what God, the Holy Spirit, is there for to give you that power. 1 Corinthians 12 and 11. Let's look at what it says. Verse, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But it is the Spirit who does all this and decides which gifts to give, to teach us. Wow. To each of us. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us gifts. We're going to look at the power of the Holy Spirit as we go on. But I want you to first say, i got to start looking at him as God. I got to quit running around with it and thinking, you know, here I am just relating to God the Father, God, God the Son, but God the Holy Spirit is never thought of as God. And I got to relate to that because that's my power source. As I'm praying, it's the Holy Spirit who takes back the words that I'm praying and interprets them to God's throne to tell God what I'm really going through. Tears may be coming down and I don't even know what kind of spiritual attack, but it's the Holy Spirit that utters words up to God to express what I'm going through. Sometimes all I got to do is cry and lean on God, the Holy Spirit, and he can lighten my load. I'm telling somebody out there, this, this is something, it might be a new revelation you've never heard of, but you need to start understanding I have God the Holy Spirit living in me and I don't have to worry about what's going on because God the Holy Spirit has feelings. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Come on, get with this. God, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. I love this. I'm reading from CED, but you know, when you read the King James Version, it's a little different. So let me go to the King James so you can see what this says to relate to what you're going through. Because here's a word that we use. And grieve not, Ephesians 4 and 30, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Don't move so fast. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way we live, by the way we act, by the things we say, by the stuff we do. Because when we grieve the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit that seals us until the day that we are fully redeemed. So that's why it goes on that all bitterness and wrath. All it's saying is God really feels bad. God the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we sit around and we worship him on Sunday and we praise him on Sunday. But how do you talk on Monday? What, what did you just say to your spouse? What, what's the word? What's the thought that went through your mind? God the Holy Spirit is saying, wow, you know, James says, how can fresh water and, and salt water come out the same mouth, you know. How can this be, how can you be so good one moment and bad? All I'm saying is God's grace will never leave us, but we grieve the Holy Spirit. And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we have less power from grieving the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we find ourselves in a situation where we miss what God may be able to do and give us power to handle that day. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The Holy Spirit wants to have personal fellowship. Please write that down. I know some people, boy, this is not an exciting topic. That's because we don't understand where the power comes from. When you understand God, the Holy Spirit is the one you're relating to, you're sitting there relating to God the Father, or you're relating to Jesus, but you don't realize that in reality, you're relating to the Holy God, the Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that sends that anointing up to God that expresses what we're going through. How do I know? Look at verse 14, chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. Amen. The grace of the Lord. Just told you that. God will give you grace. The grace of Jesus Christ. He died so I can, you know, I'm acting funky, but God's still with me. But then it said the love of God. God loves me through my stuff. But then it says the communion of the Holy Spirit. That word communion is saying, but I want you to abide in me. I, I want to commune with you. I want to fellowship with you. And I can fellowship with you when you're thinking about the right word. You know, sometimes you're thinking worry when you should be thinking Jesus. Or you should be thinking God. Or you should be thinking a promise in God's word. And you should let the Holy Spirit guide you through and navigate your heart so that a blessing comes. That's called power. It's like you're sitting there saying one moment, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you gets stirred up. And when that Holy Spirit gets stirred up, something happens that not only do you handle it, it makes you fresh. It brings you back anew. You're finding yourself in a place of power that you had not been before because of the way God is blessing you. God who? God the Holy Spirit. These are qualities about the personhood of God, about who he is and about what he has done. So if you need power, let's look at what God does, how the Spirit of God gives us power, right? Uh, I can relate first from Judges chapter 14. If we look at the story of Samson, Samson, we know, had taken the vow of the Nazarene, right? He had taken the Nazarite vow. And when Samson took that vow, it meant that he could be around nothing dead, he couldn't uh, cut his hair, you know. The, and so Samson found himself where we believe from the scriptures that the strength that Samson had was in his hair, right? But Samson taking that vow meant that he had a connection with God for taking that vow, right? That was his source of his power. But when we look at chapter 14 of Judges, we find out that the power that Samson had was not really in his hair. The power that Samson had was his connection to the Holy Ghost. How do we know? Let's take a look at it. It tells us that Samson went down to Timnath, right? And he went and saw this woman and he told his mother and father that he wanted them to get this woman for him. And then it says in verse 5, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Uh, I want you to know that that's, that's something because we, when we see this a lot of times, we don't see that his mother and father were with him and saw the great power and the spirit that God had given him as they knew Samson as the selfish, lustful, even though he had, even though they knew he was to be a judge over God's people. You know, your parents know you better than anybody else. They knew who they were living with until the spirit comes on him. It's so funny. My wife has told me on many occasions that, honey, when you were preaching, she said, when you were preaching, it's like, where did that power come from? That wasn't you. And I try to tell her constantly. That, you know, I'm working out my salvation like everybody else. But when you stand up and you have that connection with the Holy Spirit and you put the study time in and you fought back, you know, some habits and some decisions and you try to walk as straight as you could in God, then all of a sudden a mighty spirit of God will come. And don't let anybody fool you. You can go around and worship and praise preachers if you want to. The real preacher is the Holy Spirit. If the preacher is in communion with the Holy Spirit, you'll get power. If the creature is not, you'll get tricks and antics and all kind of, you know, things that will try to tickle the ear. But if the preacher is in connection, then the Holy Spirit will show up and preach. Look at verse 6. It says, and the lion jumped out. They were in danger. It wasn't just Samson in danger. His mother and father were in danger. And it says, the lion jumped out. And as soon as he did, because he had made this vow and this connection to God... It says in verse 6, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he tore him as he would have torn up a kid. Let me take it to another version so you understand. That's the King James. Well, let me read it, what it says. It says that, and but the Lord's spirit, verse 6, took control of Samson and with his bare hands, he tore the lion apart. 
as though it had been a young goat. Contrast that, right? So Samson was in connection with God and he was able to have power to destroy a lion easily. Wow. Maybe, and I'm not trying to say this, you know this better than I do. Maybe you got to watch your communion with the Holy Spirit as to why there's no power. Maybe you want to turn it off and turn it on, but sometimes when you turn it off, you don't turn it back on. And you're wondering where the power is. Well, how do I know that? Because if we were to go on to the infamous day that Samson finally told Delilah the secret of his strength, what happened? When she cut his hair, he shook himself, but nothing happened. You know why? Some people said, well, his hair was gone. No, his covenant, his communion with the Holy Spirit had been broken. The vow that he made to God, the vow was stronger than his hair. Listen, how do I know that? Let me, let me finish proving it. And then, when he finally got tied to the gristmill, his hair started growing back. It wasn't his hair that gave him strength. Check the text. He prayed, asking God. The Holy Spirit came in. Restore me to you, God. Let's read those words. So you can see that it is that connection with the Holy Spirit that gives us power. A lot of us wonder, uh, why do I have any power? It's because sometimes where we're living does not take us to a place of communion with the Holy Spirit. And what will happen after the lot of trick? This is Judges chapter 16. Let's read what, what happened to Samson when he was tied to the grist mill. Verse 28 of Judges 16. Samson prayed, please, listen to the words. Remember me, Lord God. The Philistines poke out my eyes, but make me strong one last time so I can take revenge for at least one of my eyes. And Samson was standing between the middle of two columns. Look at what happened. I'm telling somebody right now, if you want to tap back into your, into your power, I just take you. First, you got to understand God, the Holy Spirit, is a person. Relate to him like you would God the Father, God the Son. Relate to what he is. He is my power source. What does that mean? He's going to be the one that lets me know, you know, after you sin and your conscience gets pricked, that's God the Holy Spirit. When you do something well and it seems like there's joy, that's God the Holy Spirit. Samson's words let us know what he said. He said, remember me, O Lord. Make me strong one more time. He didn't say, remember me, O God. Let my hair grow back. That wasn't his strength. That wasn't his power. My real power is my communion with God. And you know what this is. As soon as I'm sitting here, you can do something where you're out of fellowship with God and you will grieve the Holy Spirit and you'll feel grief all through your body. But if you do something where you stand up strong, it may not feel good while you're doing it. But afterward, man, you got joy. You can shout. You can touch God because you realize that I now have power. Why is that? Wow. So what is our power source? First thing I got to do is know that God is... God, the Holy Spirit, is a person. He is God. Right? He's not just a part of God. In his personhood, there's unity. They're one. But they all have distinct ways that they function in our life. His way is our power source. And then, he is our, he is actually the spirit within the unity of the Godhead that does the work in the Godhead that creates Power. What am I talking about? In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, right? So it says, oh yeah, I feel somebody listening. Now. You're hearing me. You're hearing what I'm saying. Look what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was barren with no form of life. It was under a roaring covenant, covered with darkness, but, watch this, in the beginning, God created the earth, but the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. 
It was the Spirit of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Again, this. It was the Spirit of God that hovered over the earth that helped to do the creation and sustain the life that God was creating. It is the Spirit of God. What is that? The Holy Spirit in the Godhead is the one that does the power. Oh, you get this now. Go with me to Psalms 104 and Psalms 30. 104 and Psalms 30. Psalms 104, verse 30. I'm sorry. Psalms 104, verse 30. Um, let's look at verse 30 itself. You created all of them by your spirit. It's a testimony in the Psalms to the power of God. And it says, everything was created by your spirit and you give new life to the earth. What part of the spirit power that comes in God, this, God the Holy Spirit is that power of God that does the work. It's, it's God the Father that creates, right? Because they can't be separated. But understand, he uses the Spirit to do that work. It was God the Father that wanted to redeem us, but he used the Son to do that work, right? The Son was given a name that we can call him, but it's the Holy Spirit that comes to him. See how they're working? They all work together to send us our blessing. In the book of Job, Job's friend, Elihu, illustrates his understanding about the Spirit of God. Verse, chapter 33, verse 4 in the book of Job, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. I have lost you. It is the Spirit of God. So when I ask you, where does your power come from? You got to get a stronger relationship with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Ghost. It's not a thing. It's not a force. It's not something that moves gravity. It's power. Unadulterated power that's in God's word. The word that I give you, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. Because when the words are spoken, God the Holy Spirit sends a spirit through those words. So when you say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, Holy Spirit says, bow, and all of a sudden that power comes through that word and blesses you where you are. Or you say, Peter's sinking as he's walking on water, and all of a sudden he had nothing else to say, but he hollered out sincerely, help, and the Holy Spirit showed up and allowed Peter to walk on water. Water. All I'm telling you is understand that we have a power because it's God. So when you start talking to God, you can also recognize God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that's sending for the power in my life. You don't believe me? Let's talk. Let's go to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. Romans eight. Wow. So if you look at Romans chapter eight. I'm going to read, let me go back to, to a familiar text for you. Verse 1 of the 8th chapter tells you everything I just said. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Bah, I just made my point. If I walk after the spirit, there's no condemnation because I'm constantly putting my flesh underneath my feet and I'm allowing God's power to come through me because I can't be condemned if I'm walking in the spirit and when I walk in the spirit I have power how do I know let's keep reading for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death so we when we read about what the spirit of God does we know that it is because that God, the Holy Spirit, is making sure because of the salvation that was won by Jesus, he makes sure there's enough power, that there was power, and there is power, and there always will be power and salvation, that I can't be condemned. You getting this? You, the reason you can't be condemned is because Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He gave his sacrifice once and for all. 
And there was so much power within that because God the Holy Spirit was also there making sure that you had the power that everything that Jesus did works in our life. If we go to verse 11. Uh, oh, I got to read more. I got to read more. Gotta read more. Let's go to verse 9. But you are, this was still in Romans 8, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Uh, I might as well hit this before I get out of here so somebody understands. You do not have to speak in tongues to show you're full of the Holy Spirit. Not true. Not scriptural. Not biblical. If any man have the Spirit of God in them, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there, is, there are subsequent, subsequent refillings in the sense that I get closer and stronger, and that's scriptural. In the book of Ephesians, I can show you, as you get closer to God, there's a refilling of His Spirit as we grow, as we get sanctified, as the salvation comes alive. We don't, God never leaves us, but there's a strengthening, a refilling, and a powering up of that Holy Spirit as we live. So look at verse, let's read verse 9 again. But if you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not even saying it. That's why I told you no such thing as you get. So, so that means that every, only people that speak in tongues are saying it. That's not true. It's the folk who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that are saved. And that's why we need to understand in, that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And when the Spirit of God dwells in us, it blesses us to the point that we know the Holy Spirit is working through us. And it strengthens us. And you got power. Look at verse 10. And if Christ be in you, wow, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The body's dead because of sin. But my spirit is life because of righteousness. It is the Holy Spirit that leads me and guides me into righteousness and blesses me to the point that I don't have to worry about what's going on in my life. And God makes sure that this spirit, God of the Holy Spirit, makes sure that the empowering comes from God. If you look at any incident, where there was power given, and you know God was there, then you got to know all of God was there. Jesus was there, our Savior, our Son, the righteous sacrifice, uh, our Redeemer, He was there. God the Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, He was there. But when we know who, have, who also did the powering of that, it was God the Holy Spirit who made sure that there was significance. What's your problem today? Um, when you pray, it is the Holy Spirit that empowers your prayer. Are you sick? Pray. Recognize. God, the Holy Spirit, will not fail. What is your gift? Um, what's going on in your maybe your child's life? And you say, i got to get a prayer to my child. They're nowhere around me. They're going through something. You pray. It is the Spirit of God that carries that prayer the power of that prayer that will change something in somebody's life. I'm praying here, but there's so much power in God that the prayer will happen wherever it needs to happen. You've seen it, I've seen it. Please understand where to go to get help to keep going on. See, the whole theme of this, and, and, and we're going to pick this up next week, but the whole theme of this is this. You're going to have a moment in your life when you're going to need to know where your power comes from. You can't play around with scriptures. You can't do the same thing you used to do. You can't be running around church. You're going to have to know that all I got to do is understand that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in me. And because he dwells in me, I have power. That power is connected. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all work together to make sure I'm in power. I know God the Father. I know Jesus the Son, but I don't spend enough time just meditating, praying to, and understanding God, the Holy Spirit. I'm not telling you to make a religion out of God, the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you to understand when Jesus said, when he was a party in Matthew 28, 19, he said, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Get to know the Holy Spirit. 
That's where your power comes from. Dare to be different than everyone else. And the Holy Spirit will empower you and you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. God bless you. We're going to pick this up next week. But until then, know with the power living in you that whatever it is you're dealing with, you have enough power to handle it. God bless you.